ready we are boldly launched upon the deep, but soon we shall be lost in its unshored, harborless immensities. Ere that come to pass, ere the peacock's weedy hull rolls side by side with the barnacled hulls of the Leviathan, at the outset it is but well to attend to a matter almost indispensable to a thorough appreciative understanding of the more special Leviathanic revelations and illusions of all sorts which are to follow. Chapter 32. Cetology. To the whaling ship. During the months at sea, these men will be busy extracting from the whales the oil and food that make them so valuable. Many are the men, small and great, old and new, landsmen and seamen, who have at large or little written of the whale. Run over a few. The authors of the Bible, Aristotle, Pliny, Aldrovandi, Sir Thomas Brown, Gessner, Ray, Linnaeus, Andalusius, Artelli, Sibos, Pevier, John, Mareff, O'Connor, Morris, J. Ross, Brown, Reverend T. Cheever. Only those following Owen ever saw living whales, but one of them was a real professional harpooner and whaleman, I mean Captain Scoresby. On the separate subject of the Greenland or right whale, he is the best existing authority. But Scoresby knew nothing and says nothing of the great sperm whale, compared with which the Greenland whale is almost unworthy mentioning. It is some systematized exhibition of the whale in his broad genera that I would now fain put before you. First, the uncertain, unsettled condition of this science of cetology is in the very vestibule attested by the fact that in some quarters it still remains a moot point whether a whale be a fish. In his System of Nature, A.D. 1776, Linnaeus declares, I hereby separate the whales from the fish. But of my own knowledge, I know that down to the year 1850, sharks and shad, alewives and herring, against Linnaeus's express edict, were still found dividing the possession of the same seas with the Leviathan. The ground upon which Linnaeus would fain have banished the whales from the waters, he states as follows. On account of their warm bilocular heart, lungs, movable eyelids, hollow ears, penem intrantem, feminam, mammis lactentem, and finally ex lege naturae jure meritoque. I submitted all this to my friends Simeon Macy and Charlie Coffin of Nantucket, both messmates of mine in a certain voyage, and they united in the opinion that the reasons set forth were altogether insufficient. Charlie profanely hinted they were humbug. Be it known that, waiving all argument, I take the good old-fashioned ground that the whale is a fish. This fundamental thing settled, the next point is, in what internal respect does the whale differ from other fish? Above, Linnaeus has given you those items, but to be short, a whale is a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. However contracted, that definition is the result of expanded meditation. Now then come the grand divisions of the entire whale host. First, according to magnitude, I divide the whales into three primary books, subdivisible in two chapters, and these shall comprehend them all, both small and large. One, the folio whale. Two, the octavo whale. Three, the duodecimo whale. As the type of the folio, I present the sperm whale, of the octavo, the grampus, of the duodecimo, the porpoise. Book one, folio, chapter one, sperm whale. Hawker said, signals are hit. Chapter two, right whale. The anvil-headed whale. Chapter three, finback. This is the most venerable of the Leviathan. The largest inhabitant of the globe. Hunted by man. Periodical and commerce. Scraping along the Tartarian tile. The banished and unconquerable cane of his race. Chapter four. Chapter five. Chapter six, sulfur bottom. All his particularities will, in many other places, be enlarged upon. It is chiefly with his name that I now have to do. So logically considered, it is absurd. Some centuries ago, when the sperm whale was almost wholly unknown in his own proper individuality, and when his oil was only accidentally obtained from the stranded fish, in those days, spermaceti, it would seem, was popularly supposed to be derived 
derived from a creature identical with one then known in England as the Greenland, or right whale. It was the idea also that the same spermaceti was that quickening humor of the Greenland whale, which the first syllable of the word literally expresses. In those times also, spermaceti was exceedingly rare, not being used for light, but only as an ointment and medicant. When, as I opine in the course of time, the true nature of spermaceti became known, its original name was still retained by the dealers, no doubt to enhance its value by a notion so strangely significant of its scarcity. And so the appellation must at last have come to be bestowed upon the whale from which this spermaceti was really derived. Book two, Octavo. Chapter one, Grampus. Chapter two, Blackfish. Chapter three, Narwhal. He carries an everlasting Mephistophelian grip. Nostril whale. Chapter four, Killer. Chapter five, Thrasher. His oil is very superior. And fine. We are all killers. Both are outlaws, even in the lawless sea. It is of moderate octavo size, varying from 15 to 25 feet in length, and of corresponding dimensions round the waist. He swims in herds. He is never regularly hunted, though his oil is considerable in quantity and pretty good for light. By some fishermen, his approach is regarded as premonitory of the advance of the great sperm whale. Book 3, Duodecimo. Chapter 1, Huzzah Porpoise. Chapter 2, Algerine Porpoise. Chapter 3, Mealy Mouthed Porpoise. A pirate. A felonious visit to a meal bag. I have lowered for him many times, but never yet saw him captured. The most mean and mealy aspect. This is the common porpoise found almost all over the globe. The name is of my own bestow, for there are more than one sort of porpoises, and something must be done to distinguish them. I call him thus, because he always swims in hilarious shoals which upon the broad sea keep tossing themselves to heaven like caps in a 4th of July crowd. A well-fed, plump huzzah porpoise will yield you one good gallon of good oil. It may never have occurred to you that a porpoise spouts. Indeed, his spout is so small that it is not very readily discernible. But the next time you have a chance, watch him, and you will then see the great sperm whale himself in miniature. Beyond the duodecimo, this system does not proceed inasmuch as the porpoise is the smallest of the whales. Above, you have all the leviathans of note, but there are a rabble of uncertain, fugitive, half-fabulous whales, which, as an American whaleman, I know by reputation, but not personally. If any of the whales shall hereafter be caught and marked, then he can be readily incorporated into this system, according to his folio, octavo, or duodecimo magnitude. From Icelandic, Dutch, and Old English authorities, there might be quoted other lists of uncertain whales, blessed with all manner of uncouth names, but I admit them as altogether obsolete, and can hardly help suspecting them for mere sounds, full of leviathanism, but signifying nothing. This whole book is but a draft, nay, but the draft of a draft. Oh, time, strength, cash, and patience. I am aware that down to the present time, the fish-styled lamatins and dugongs, pigfish and sowfish of the coffins of Nantucket, are included by many naturalists among the whales. But as these pigfish are a noisy, contemptible scent, mostly lurking in the mouths of rivers and feeding on wet hay, and especially as they do not spout, I deny their credentials as whales, and have presented them with their passports to quit the kingdom of cytology.